Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about a game that I recently worked on called Stereo Boy. Stereo Boy is a puzzle adventure game that uh, has some unconventional mechanics uh, that uh, led to some interesting design challenges. And I'm gonna talk about those mechanics and challenges tonight. Okay, so first of all, quick about me. Uh, my name is Jeff, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I am primarily a programmer by trade. Um, way back in the aughts, I did work as a professional game developer. There's some games there that I worked on. You get a prize if you can name all three of them. Um, but I actually spent most of my career working at cloud startups. Uh, most recently, I spent about four years at Slack. Uh, but for the past year, I have been working full-time on games again at a studio called Main Gauche Games, which I founded with my partner. Um, and uh, yeah, our first game as that studio is Stereo Boy. Um, quick history of the project before I get into the details. Um, it started off as a game jam game during this year's Global Game Jam. Um, and it was kind of this twin stick shooter where you could kind of jump across two different maps. Uh, and it was interesting enough to us that we decided to take about six months to productionize it. And over the course of time, it became less of a shooter and more of a puzzle game. So in terms of the puzzle mechanics, um, there are a lot of conventional puzzle elements in Stereo Boy. Um, you play a little robot that walks around an isometric environment that's made of cubes. You can push blocks. You press switches that open doors. You can orbit the camera around, then it reveals hidden paths and secrets. Um, we even retained a little bit of the combat from the Game Jam version of the game, but it's really more of a kind of icing on the cake type thing. So as I mentioned earlier, all of these are very conventional puzzle mechanics. And I think you could build a pretty interesting game just based on this. Uh, but what I think is actually compelling about Stereo Boy is uh, the teleportation mechanic that's in the game. Um, so what we're seeing in the video here is not two separate videos of the same game. Uh, this is actually just one video. Uh, you can see that the screen is split into two viewports, and each viewport is display displaying a separate world. And these are parallel worlds, so the player can actually move between them by teleporting. Um, so you can teleport anytime you want in Stereo Boy, as long as you obey some safety rules. The rule here is that you're going to teleport to the same relative position in the opposite world as long as there's flat ground underneath you. So the game will not let you teleport into a wall or teleport you into like a bottomless pit or something like that. Right? So um, what you can do with this navigation mechanic alone is to just make some traversal puzzles. So this is what the second level of the game looks like. You start off in the left-hand side, and you're trying to make it to that glowing gold cube on the right side. And along the way, you're going to run into some obstacles, right? There's like a wall in the way. There's a cliff in the way. Um, and you normally wouldn't be able to get past, but you can use teleportation to get yourself through that. You can teleport to the opposite side and use a path or a ramp that will get you around those obstacles. Um, so we actually were able to kind of extend this into some pretty complex levels um, where the paths through the levels aren't all that obvious. It requires a lot of teleporting back and forth. You can see a couple examples here in the videos. They're basically just mazes, right? Um, and you know, I, I think that they look pretty cool, but um, probably this alone would not make a full game, right? Like, it, the gameplay wouldn't be super interesting, or it would get tedious after maybe like six or so levels, right? Um, so where I think the game come, starts to come together is when we can combine some of those traditional puzzle elements with teleportation. Um, and probably the most prominent example of that in the game is allowing certain objects to teleport, like pushable blocks. So in Stereo Boy, we have two different kinds of blocks that can teleport. Um, one kind will teleport whenever the player teleports. And another type of teleporting block will teleport when you shoot it. Um, so this makes your traditional block pushing puzzle, I think, a bit more rich and complex. Um, and on top of that, the teleporting blocks also have to obey the same safety rules that the player does. So there are certain situations where the block is unable to teleport because it's blocked by a wall or something like that. And in fact, a lot of the advanced gameplay in some of the later levels are about moving blocks very intentionally into positions where they can teleport or they can't teleport in order to solve the puzzle. OK, so that's basically it on mechanics. Um, now I, I think I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the implementation process and some of the design challenges that having two worlds uh, got us into. OK, so I guess first and foremost, as a game developer, your job is to make your game read clearly to the player. And the core legibility problem in Stereo Boy is you have these two visible worlds, and the player is effectively inside both of them. 
So how do you actually make it read to the player? And how do you convey a sense that they have a relative position in the opposite side of the screen? Um, so first of all, we want to call attention to what we call the active world, which is where the player currently is. Um, if you stop and look at the character model, it's pretty small, right? So the mere presence of that model on one side of the screen or the other isn't enough to draw your attention as the player. So we had to do more than that. And so you can see in the example here, we're playing with lighting and, and, and in particular saturation effects in either viewport in order to emphasize the active world. This is actually a little bit of a tricky tuning problem because if you turn the saturation down too much in the inactive world, um, the player is no longer going to be able to see the details there. And we actually do want people to understand how the opposite world is laid out. OK, so if this solves the problem of telling the player which world they're inside of, um, how do we give them a sense of where they are in the opposite world? Right. Well, um, you've probably seen the examples of this already in the other videos, but we actually render this little preview hologram on the other side. The thing I do want to call out about that hologram is that it actually disappears. You can see that when it kind of walks into the wall, it goes away. And what that's supposed to signify is it's no longer safe for the player to teleport. Um, for most of the development cycle, this was our solution for telling the player what their relative position was in the opposite world. But um, pretty late in the development cycle, about like two weeks before ship, uh, we got some feedback from our play testers that they wanted some more hints and in particular, I think people were wanting to know some more context about their position. They wanted to know their elevation in the other world, even if they couldn't teleport. And the hologram wasn't doing a good job of communicating that, because literally the hologram wasn't even being displayed for a lot of the time. So our hack for that was to add another kind of double rendering thing, where we show this pretty loud and distracting effect that we called the probe, where you can kind of like ping your location and it'll draw your location in the opposite world, even if that location is like embedded in a wall or hovering over a pit. Um, because this is such a visible and distracting effect, we, it's not on all the time. You actually hit a button to activate it. This is definitely one of those like Band-Aid mechanics that you add into your game. And I'm actually not sure if it signifies like a fundamental flaw in the way that the game is constructed, or just like a nice quality of life type thing. So if you get a chance to play the game, let me know how you feel about that. All right, so those are the kind of design and visual issues. Uh, let's talk a little bit about implementation. Uh, and what I mean by that really is like the runtime representation of the game. How do you just like implement these two worlds in code? Um, how do you make sure that objects in the two different worlds don't interact with each other? Um, so I think like with most things in game development, it's all just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Um, this game is implemented in Unity, and the container for objects in Unity is a scene. And there really isn't a great way to separate simulation and rendering inside of a Unity scene. Um, some of you who are familiar with Unity might say, oh, just use layers. But we found that to be a very clumsy tool and not a great general solution. So what we ended up doing was this basic setup that you can see here. Um, objects in either world are essentially on opposite sides of the y-axis. So every object in the left world has a negative x-coordinate, and every object in the in the right world has a positive x coordinate. And this makes your math pretty easy, right? You want to ask, well, what world is your object in? Just look at the sign of the x coordinate. And if you wanted to teleport an object across from one world to the other, you can just add a fixed constant to the x coordinate, and it'll get you there. So um, that solution actually worked with surprisingly few issues, but it was, wasn't 100% airtight all the time. Um, in particular for things that use like ray casts. You can see here that th there's like a targeting laser that the, that the player has, and it's rendering on both sides. This was a bug that we had to fix, right? Another example of this is that you could actually get shot by ranged enemies from the opposite <laughs> world, because we just didn't have a limit on the ray cast for the line of sight code. Luckily, when this type of thing happens, the really nice quality of, this, of these types of problems is that they're obvious, right? Those are the best types of problems. Like either a crash or program, or there's something that's super visual that you can see. Um, so we could iron these out on a case-by-case -case basis. OK, so the last category of implementation issues I want to talk about is process, um, which mostly has to do with just tools, basically, right? Um, we made just under 60 levels for Stereo Boy, and we made them really, really quickly. So iteration time was really important to us. Um, but if you think about the design of each individual level, it's actually pretty complicated, right? Because you have to design two environments at the same time. And you also have to make sure that they line up just so, right? You want to make sure that the locations where the player can teleport 
are where you think they're going to be. Um, so the first way that we went about dealing with this particular issue uh, was basically giving the level designer a view of the game that the player effectively has, right? So this is, a, this is just Unity right here, but it's a little bit different of a layout than the default, right? We have two scene views with two separate cameras, and the cameras are just positioned in the scene, so they're pointing at each world respectively. Um, and we wrote some editor scripts to synchronize the camera views, so when you rotate or reposition the camera in one scene, uh, the other one basically adjusts to its same relative position. And you know, this really gives the, the level designer a, a, a good way of visualizing what the level is going to look like when the game actually runs. So another problem is visualizing where the player can teleport and where they can't. Um, actually, not seeing where you can teleport, I think, is a feature rather than a bug for the player. Right? A lot of the aha moments of the game are walking around the levels and finding a route that you didn't expect. But you do want those routes to be very obvious to the designer as opposed to the player, right? And for a while, our solution to this was that we just like design the level, we'd run the game, we'd walk around, and we'd just like press the teleport button and see if it worked, right? But obviously, that type of solution doesn't really scale to a full game, and it's really, really, really mistake prone. Um, one of the really insidious problems that we had to try to solve uh, was sequence breaks. So we designed this really nice and clever puzzle, or, or so we thought. But then we realized later that all the player had to do was just like walk to a position in the opposite world and teleport behind the puzzle and just completely skip it, right? So what we did to, I think, almost fully mitigate this problem is to visualize where you could teleport inside the editor itself. So you can see these gold dots that are rendering on the objects on the terrain here. Um, and that's just using the same code that the, ga the, the, the game runtime uses to determine whether a teleport is safe or not. And it updates inside the editor dynamically as you add and remove geometry to the level. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about mechanically and implementation-wise about Stereo Boy. Um, if you're interested in actually trying the game out, I've brought it with me here tonight. Uh, it is also launched on Steam. It's on sale right now. There's also a free demo, so you don't have to pay me any money to play it. Um, on the technical side of things, if you're interested in some of these topics, we have a couple of articles in our devlog that go into a little bit more depth, maingosh.game slash devlog. And you can reach me on Twitter. I'm underscore Jeff All right. Thank you. Hey, what's going on? How did you actually go about designing the levels? Like, did you start on paper and then do it in Unity, or did you just like feel it around, especially when you start designing the really complex levels? Like, how did you even just design those puzzles? Um, so there, there were two of us that were doing most of, most of the level design, so I can speak for myself. It's, it's kind of funny. We were both so heads down designing our own levels that I didn't actually know what my partner's method was. Um, for me personally, I kind of just used the Unity editor as my sketch pad, so I didn't do a lot of like laying it out on paper. There's a, there's a certain romanticism to me about people who game design on paper, and I'm like, you know, like I, I remember seeing like Jonathan Blow's notebook for The Witness, right, and just had all these things sketched out, and I'm like, wow, that's a sign of genius or something like that. But no, I just was in, in Unity. What I did do is that we had a bunch of scenes that were suffixed with the word lab, so it was like the lab for this mechanic or whatever, and I, there was just there's just like JL, which is my initials, so it was like JL Labs one through ten inside of our project. And what I would often do is start with a particular puzzle that was gray box that I wanted to have. And then after that point, it was just a matter of situating a level. Um, and then there's a lot of deleting and editing. Yeah, I think it's comparable to anything. You write something, you prepare a talk, like I did right now. It's a lot of it's like you have, you have these like really grandiose plans in the outset. And then it just kind of gets ground out. Yeah. Um, we did no market analysis whatsoever. So, um, and, and, I, and maybe to our peril, I, I've gone back and forth about this in my own head a lot. In fact, I was just talking to someone before the talk came on about this, like, you're an indie developer, you want to get a game out there, but you also want to make money. There's all these, like, kind of goals that you have to, like, try to achieve at the same time. For us, um, I think what made it easy for us is that we kind of let ourselves off the hook on the commercial side of things, and it's just like, we need to ship, right? I don't know if you've, you've read the book by uh, Derek Yu, this, this, the creator of Spelunky, where he, he talks about finishing being a skill. 
And, you know, I've worked professionally across a lot of different projects, but this is like kind of the first time it was fully my, uh, my own. And it's a very different thing to do that. So we allowed ourselves to just like set launching on Steam a game that we felt proud to have in the world as our bar. And so we didn't really do any market analysis. And of course, after the fact, I'm like, oh my God, why didn't we just like collect wish lists before the, you know, the game launched and that kind of thing. Um, but honestly, when I look back on the process, there wouldn't have been a time where I thought it was a good use of my time to even think about that kind of stuff because there's just so many other things. And we crunched the shit out of the last two months of this project, which is not something I would advise necessarily, but this, I don't know. For me, at least, it's what I needed to get, get the game across the line. Um, I would say, as, as in my general assessment of this game, is, is that this type of game is like career suicide if you're trying to make money. It's like kind of in between genres. It's a puzzle game, which does not do very well on Steam. All kinds of things that you shouldn't do if you're trying to make a commercially suc successful game. Yeah. But I had a good time making it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How was the launch and what's next? So the launch is what I call a huge friends and family success, um, which, for those, which for those of you that might, might be familiar with that, like are, 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 you probably are aware of, of, of the peril of that. I kind of feel like I just like started my own club a little bit and invited people to join, you know what I mean? And like, I, like I'm not sure, uh, I don't know. I think there's always part of your brain that's like, this is gonna be a huge mainstream success. But I don't know, like I actually think that this game would be a pretty nice Switch title, for example. I would just love to see this on Switch. And we just got Switch access. Um, it took a lot of like back channeling and that kind of thing to, to get that sorted out. But um, now we have to decide whether our time is best spent working on game two or just trying to do what we can with this game. And that's like a kind of existential question for us. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yes, in the back. I'm not sure how to frame this exactly, but I'm, I'm thinking about a question about the interface. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at your website here, and it says uh, it's an isometric sci fi puzzle box that began as a deliberate attempt to avoid making a puzzle game. So uh, that, I'm, I'm quoting that to feeds into my question, which is, if someone sees this for the first time, with whom are they competing? Themselves against the amount of time they take to do it or uh, to get to a certain number of levels? I mean, are there, are there, there's, no, there's no way of scoring this and no way of timing it and no way of competing. Are all of those true, any of those true? Thank you. Right, so why is the player even playing the game? Um, so I, I guess there's a couple different different ways to, to situate that. I, I don't know. Like if you're if you're like sitting down and playing Wordle, you're not having like a philosophical conversation with yourself about why you're playing it, right? You're just doing it for the dopamine hit. And I think this game, in my opinion, like does provide a little bit of that. So it is fun in and of it, you know, in itself to to, to play it. Um, there are kind of I would say very conventional tropes in the way that the game progresses. There are like little shiny collectibles that you can pick up if you're a completionist about it. Um, I do think that the puzzles themselves are interesting enough geometrically that you kind of want to go through and just like win the picture of looking at it. There are achievements. And then we also, and I don't recommend this either, like in the last month of the game, wrote like f a 5,000 word story that's kind of like distributed throughout the game, um, which came from playtesters that were probably asking similar questions to what you're asking right now. It's like, why am I playing this? What is the setting here? Because you have a little cute robot, you have these environments there. It seems to imply some kind of setting, right? It seems to imply something there, which is not required when you're playing like a crossword puzzle or Sudoku or something like that. Um, so we did bake that in there. I wouldn't say it's like the most fully mature piece of the game, um, but those elements are in there. Does that answer your question? That did very well. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Great, thanks everybody.